Hey everyone, thank you for coming out to our first Hoover lunch of the quarter. We're very thankful to have a uh, Hoover Research Fellow, Dr. David Henderson, here with us to, for a discussion about economics. He'll be uh, speaking on the topic of five myths about free markets. His research typically focuses on the unintended consequ consequences of government regulation. He's the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics blogs for EconLog, and he occasionally writes for the Wall Street Journal and Fortune magazine. Since 1984, he has served as a professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Thanks, Kyle, and thank you. Oh, an applause to start with. That's a, that's a good sign. And uh, if I'd been thinking, I would have brought a copy of my Concise Encyclopedia, and I always kind of plunk it down and people go, concise? But each article is concise. There are over 200 articles, and each, each article is concise. My topic today is five myths about free markets. And the reason I chose that topic is I've been advocating free markets for about 40 years. And during that time, I've noticed that when people object, it's the same group of myths that come up again and again. And in fact, I used to give talks and various things, and then in the q and it would always be about these myths. So why not just give a talk about the myths? And now why five? I could have chosen 10 or 12. I have time for five. <laughs> And let me just define my terms when I talk about myths about free markets. I need to explain what a free market is and isn't, because even that is nowadays understood. When people think about free markets, they often think of what we call crony capitalism, the idea of, of governments and business interacting and getting special privileges. Free markets mean that everyone's free to buy and sell, to exchange, to set mutually agreeable terms for those exchanges. People are free to enter and exit a business. So for example, one area where we don't have free markets in this country is the taxi cab industry. We're in all major cities but one, Washington, D.C. You have to get permission to enter, and permission is very expensive. It costs tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why Washington, D.C.? Well, because Congress controls the Washington, D.C. government's budget, and Congress is the customer. And Congress understands that if they can allow free entry, they get lower cab fares. Now, before getting to the myths, let me point out one big bonus myth about economics itself, a mistaken view that most economists heard. Who here has heard economics referred to as the dismal science? Now, if you ask your professors, even many on this campus, even some who are kind of free market oriented, I can almost guarantee you they will give you the wrong answer about why it's called the dismal science. The ones who think of themselves as informed, and I used to be one of those, will tell you that it's because of Thomas Robert Malthus who wrote the famous essay on population about 200 years ago in which he said that agricultural output would grow arithmetically and population would grow exponentially and so the result would be mass starvation. Wrong. The person who came up with the term dismal science was Thomas Carlyle, an anti-capitalist author 200 years ago. At the time, free market economists, believe it or not, were the ones who dominated economics. And they also were strong opponents of slavery. And Thomas Carlyle said that economics is dismal because the economists opposed slavery. Now, what's this party animal's view of hopeful? So that's my bonus myth. And that leads to myth number one. Myth number one is that free markets promote racism. Many people believe that when markets are free, employers will use that freedom to discriminate against various unpopular races. That idea is mistaken. It ignores some basic economic reasoning and a whole lot of history. Let me start by quoting the French philosopher Voltaire, who saw how free markets actually create tolerance. He said, go into the London Stock Exchange, a more respectable place than many a court, and you will see representatives from all nations gathered together for the utility of men. Here, Jew, Mohammedan, Muslim, and Christian deal with each other as though they were all of the same faith and only apply the word infidel to people who go bankrupt. Gary Becker, who's affiliated with Hoover, a University of Chicago economist who won the Nobel Prize in economics, pointed out in his dissertation in the 50s why free markets create tolerance. It's because of the pro profit motive. Because employers want to make money, it's costly to them to give up opportunities to employ productive people who are of, quote, the wrong race. And so every time they turn away someone from the wrong race because of his 
in spite of his productivity, they give up a profit-making opportunity. That doesn't mean they won't do it. It does mean that if they do it, the market makes them pay for it. And that means that the people who do well, the people who expand more, get bigger market share, are going to be the ones who are least discriminatory. Um, and that's why the clearest cases we have of discrimination are those that are enforced by government. Take streetcars in the South before the 1960s, before all the laws that made segregation illegally. The segregation laws that were imposed in the 1890s were laws. In other words, they were state and local laws that required segregation. Now previously, the streetcar companies had segregated. They had segregated by smoker and non-smoker. And then when they had to segregate by race, they had to give that up, and they fought it. They fought it in courts. They tried to just ignore the law, but the law got tougher and tougher, and finally they succumbed to that morass, morass of discrimination and racism. Or consider one of the most extreme forms of institutionalized racism in the 20th century. South Africa's apartheid. Apartheid, which means separateness, officially began in 1948, but it followed earlier laws called the color bar, which were passed in the 1920s. Before those laws were passed, white mine owners wanted to hire black workers to work in the mines. Black workers were productive and were willing to work for a little less. Mine owners, seeing those very profitable opportunities, this beautiful mix of labor and capital, didn't want to discriminate. But the mine workers union, composed solely of whites, protested and seized the mines in a famous 1923 strike. And are you ready for their slogan that they had on the banner? Workers of the world unite and fight for a white South Africa. Kind of Karl Marx meet David Duke. And later they became active in elections and through a series of steps introduced apartheid. Myth number two, when markets are free, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And a related myth, the rich stole it. Well, the, original, the myth is half true. When markets are free, the rich get richer and the poor get richer. Um, by the way, in a free market economy, most of the rich earn it or inherit it from people who earned it. Let's take the earning part. The Forbes 400, which is a measure of the top 400 people wealth-wise, 70% are self-made. They either started with nothing, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, or started with something, but grew it substantially, like the Koch brothers. Early 20th century economist Joseph Schumpeter, talking about how markets create economic growth and how good that is for the average person, said it best. Queen Elizabeth, that was the first, not the one with the hats. Right? Queen Elizabeth owned silk stockings. That was 500 years ago. The capitalist achievement does not typically consist in providing more silk stockings for queens, but in bringing them within the reach of factory girls in return for steadily decreasing amounts of effort. With economic growth, which is caused mainly by free markets and the increasing division of labor it gives rise to, what was a luxury for the few becomes in short order a necessity for the many. And I turned mine off, but you probably can figure out this is a great example. This was a luxury to most of us in the early 90s. It had become very widespread in the late 90s, and by the mid-2000s, it had become a necessity for most. Or think back, when economists want, economic historians want to measure British standards of living in the 18th and 19th centuries, they look at a luxury item that was in people's budget and look at how much item, how much of that item was in people's budget. And I bet you'll never guess what the item was. Do you want to try? It, spice isn't totally off. Uh, tea. It's, yes, tea. Tea was a luxury 200 years ago. And it became a bigger and bigger part of people's budget. Or how about home heating without a fireplace? That was non-existent in almost all the 19th century. Now virtually everyone has it. Or refrigeration. What did some of your, I used to say parents, I'm probably going to have to say grandparents, uh, call your refrigerator? The icebox. The icebox. Any idea why? 
Yeah, uh, cold air sinks. <laughs> so what you do, you used to have these box things with a little thing on top that you put ice in and the cold air sinks and keeps things cold. We actually, I go to a cottage, that's one of the most primitive cottages in the area I go to. Uh, my grandfather built it in 1922. We didn't get electricity until 1958 when I was seven years old. And so we had an ice box every summer. So I, had a, I have a vague memory of that. Or consider this, who was the wealthiest man in America early in the 20th century? John D. Rockefeller. At its peak, John D. Rockefeller's net worth measured in today's dollars was about 200 billion, which would make him richer than Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined. But think what you have that he didn't. He couldn't watch TV, play video games, surf the internet, or send email. During the summer, he didn't have air conditioning. For most of his life, he couldn't travel by airplane. He didn't even have a 1G cell phone. And here's the big one. If he got sick, he couldn't use many medicines, including penicillin. Calvin Coolidge was the president in the mid-1920s in the United States. He had a teenage son who was out playing tennis too long in the tennis court, got a blister, and died. That essentially would not happen in America today. So here's the test of whether you're richer than Rockefeller. There's an old song about that, by the way. Would you trade places with him? So who here would not, as you, trade places with him? Would not. So I got five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10. Who, 11, who would? One. Uh, I'm curious as heck, how come? Okay, okay. So 11 out of 12 of you who answered are basically saying, in a sense, you're better off, you're richer than Rockefeller. Um, by the way, I just heard about this article. I should have read it before coming up here. But the latest Freeman, anyone ever look at the Freeman? Apparently has an article by a, a law professor who's very economically literate named Andrew Morris. And again, I'm just going from what a friend told me who read it. And it's about Elvin Presley, Elvin, Elvin, Elvis Presley's mansion. And he goes in, and it was, you know, Presley died in 77. And so this is just before 77, the amount of stuff he had in it and the kinds of things he had in it. And everyone thought of those as incredible luxuries. And now the things you would see in there, you would pick up at a flea market, right? Like a VCR, oh my goodness, a VCR. I remember uh, when I used to be on TV in Rochester, the local station in the mid-70s, I had to get my one wealthy friend to tape it for me because a VCR cost two grand in 1976 dollars and it wasn't that good. Now you can get one for well under 100 new, if you want one. <laughs> By the way, my wife is a freelance editor, and we were at a party recently, and she said she so loves email because it's revolutionized her business. It's so much better, she said, than those old-fashioned technologies, fax and FedEx. That didn't get a laugh, but see, fax and FedEx came along both when I was an adult. We didn't even have faxes in the early 80s. I got time for this story. In fact, I remember at University of Rochester, my Dean William Meckling, just a really great man, he helped end the draft, and I'll tell you that story if you're ever interested, but uh, he, he needed something sent to Iowa, Ohio State University, and fax, this is in the late 70s, and he said, who do you think had a fax machine at Ohio State? And I said, Woody Hayes, and he said, right. <laughs> the guy for whom it was most valuable. <laughs> That's the coach of the Ohio State team. Myth number three, free markets degenerate into monopoly. False. Why is it false? Because competition, people often think of competition as being this very delicate flower, you know, like an orchid that requires fertilizer and moisture and the right amount of sunshine. Wrong analogy, wrong metaphor. Competition is like this very hardy weed that you have to stomp to prevent. And why? Because when there's monopoly and it generates monopoly profits, those monopoly profits attract entrance the way honey attracts ants. Now, one of the mod, and so what I'm basically saying also is we don't really need antitrust laws. Um, one of the 
latest arguments for antitrust about how we have to kind of nurture competition was made by the Federal Trade Commission when a couple of years ago they investigated Apple for monopolizing the market for software used to run mobile f devices such as the iPhone. And what was their case? What did they rest their case on? It's what economists call network effects. The idea is that network effects, you get on the network and once the network starts, there's a, it's just easier that way so the first movers have an advantage. And they said, quote, it makes it particularly difficult for competitors to break in. The only, their own evidence belies their statement. The first significant mover in the market for smartphones was BlackBerry. So if their, net, if their new theory of network effects is, is correct, Apple has little hope of gaining monopoly power. If, on the other hand, Apple does pose a genuine competitive threat to BlackBerry's dominance, which I think we're pretty clear now it does, then network effects aren't enough to create monopoly. The main creator of durable monopoly is government. When you think of monopolies that bug you, what do you think of? Really? Airlines? Wow. I think those are one of the most competitive industries we have. So I'm going to go there in a minute because I didn't, I didn't sell you. Uh, what else? <laughs> public utilities and? Post office. Government post office. Public, and cable. There's nothing in cable that says you can't have more than one competitor. And certain market areas in the United States do have more than one cable company because the municipal government allowed it. But municipal governments generally like to allow only one competitor. But you got me so spooled up about airlines. Let me just say a little bit. You don't know Monopoly when it comes to airlines. If you'd been traveling in the 70s, you would have known Monopoly. 1938, 38, the Civil Aeronautics Board, Board forms. And from 1938 to 78, when we had deregulation, does anyone know how many new entrants there were at a large level, with a, you know, at a large interstate level? Zero. If you wanted to cut price, you had to file your rate change with the Civil Aeronautics Board, and they had a month to say yes or no. And meanwhile, your competitors could go to the Civil Aeronautics Board. And do you think they might object to you cutting price? Yeah, they did. So how did we, how did we get to deregulation? Well, it was because, in part, there were two airlines that, were sh that showed us how we could do so well with no regulation. Civil Aeronautics Board regulated interstate airlines. Well, Texas is a big state, so is California. So in California, there was an airline called Pacific Southwest that just was within the state, and therefore they didn't have to file fares with anyone. I remember once flying from, from LA to Oakland for $8 in the mid-70s. In, in Texas, there was Southwest Airlines that flew between San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston. And they had very low fares. And that was actually part of what started the push for deregulation. So if you think we got monopoly now, you should have seen it then. You were going to? Well, I think, I don't know. I was actually thinking of airlines as something that might prove the point. Because like, after 2001, air travel, after regulation, was heavy, kind of. And then part of it had to do with security and all these other things. But doesn't it seem like a lot of the inconvenience, you know, the way we look at air travel today is, OK, low cost airlines. You know, the, the, the carriers that a lot of people use are people that we don't particularly enjoy, and that's a lot. A lot of it does have to do with government regulation. They're, yeah, they're, yeah, and the yeah. thing I don't enjoy about yeah. the airline is not mainly when I'm on the flight, it's mainly the people who feel me up on my way to the flight yeah. and, and, or take naked pictures of me. And, and so, yeah. Now, it is true that they've cut, and I'll get to you, it is true that they've cut meals and so on, but, you know, the economics of meals were interesting. It cost, and this was a, an estimate in the early 80s, so think of those years' dollars. It cost them about 20 bucks to have a meal per person. When you think of all the labor and all the stuff, and it's like, whoa, is that worth it? <laughs> I don't think so. So having CPK there, where you can buy something for nine bucks just before getting on the flight, it's a great deal, and, it, and it's just what we've chosen. If we had wanted to pay for meals, they'd have meals. It's just we're showing by our dollar votes we don't want it. Uh, he had a question, so if you want to. Sure. Uh, thank you. Sure. I, I couldn't agree with you more um, on, on the TSA right. uh, regulations, especially with recent events with Senator Rand Paul. Rand Paul, right. <laughs> right. Uh, and I think, I guess the classic example with um, uh, the, 
uh, less competition um, or predatory pricing in the airline industry uh, was back when when Northwest was dominating small uh, small markets. Now, of course, they have been acquired by Delta, and essentially, um, they would go into small markets, um, and they were very you know very high profit markets. Mm -hmm. A new competitor would enter the market. Um, Northwest would then drop their prices, generally. Um, by 75%, okay? And they'll wait, at, wait it out until it's no longer profitable for that competitor, um, or it's, it's the, the, their competitor then leaves the market, and what does Northwest do? They raise their rates by triple. Um, so I guess I, guess I, I want to hear what your perspective on that is. Okay. So you've given me actually the best case one can give on that. Uh, and, and, um, and the reason has to do with the weird cost structure of airlines, that they've got these very high fixed costs and very low marginal costs. And so what that allows them to do is cut rates dramatically. And, and so you do get this instability. And there's an economist at University of Chicago, I don't know if he's retired by now, but Lester Telser, who's written a book on this basically laying out that there's, in economics, there's something called the core, and there's no core here. And actually, that's why I, that's another reason why I don't want the antitrust people going after the airlines. It's very hard to make money in the airline industry for that reason, even for Northwest. And in fact, there's this old joke, how do you make a million dollars in the airline industry? Start with 10 million. And Bob Crandall, who was the president of American Airlines, he will admit publicly he's done so he never invests in an airline. And so the point is that that's a big problem, but I think the antitrust laws have made it worse. Now, while I'm talking about monopoly, what about the robber barons? Who here has heard of the robber barons? Okay. Well, they were neither robbers nor barons. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the show? Instead, they were competitors who brought goods and services to consumers more cheaply. Where did the phrase come from? It was applied to a guy named Cornelius Vanderbilt. What did he do? Revolutionized the steamship industry by bringing down rates dramatically, like some numbers like 75%. He broke a monopoly granted to Robert Fulton by the New York State government. And that's what, it, and, and, um, that's what made it cheap for Europeans in the late 19th century to leave Europe and come here. Now, the New York State Legislature had given a monopoly to Fulton up the Hudson River. Well, that's interstate commerce. So uh, Vanderbilt took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Justice Marshall said, you're absolutely right. States can't regulate interstate commerce. And New Jerseyites celebrated. They had great parties and rallies to celebrate this decision. So what did he do? He made travel cheap for us. And that turns out to be part of a pattern. That's, in fact, the main thing that the so-called trusts did in the late 19th century. You've heard about the antitrust laws. Well, they were aimed at the trusts, and trusts were these very large corporations that dominated in seven industries. Now, Loyola University economist Thomas DiLorenzo, in a 1985 article published in the International Review of Law and Economics, had thought about it as follows. He said, look, if these trusts were so bad for consumers, they ought to be restraining output. Think about basic economics. If you have a monopoly, you keep output low and price high. So he said, in the period when they're forming, you ought to see output falling relative to the economy in general. So he looked at the seven industries, and he found that their output rose by 175% over the same period that the GDP rose 24%. In other words, they expanded at seven times the, the speed, and, that, and they were bringing down prices. And Lester Telsford, Telsford, the economist I mentioned a minute ago, pointed out that between 1880 and 1890, the output of petroleum products, that was Rockefeller's industry, rose 393% and price fell 61%. And Telsford wrote, quote, the oil trust did not charge high prices because it had 90% of the market. It got 90% of the refined oil market by charging low prices. There's a related point, and, and that is the big distinction between economic power and political power. There's a huge difference. One is coercive, the other isn't. There's a bureaucrat somewhere in Pacific Grove where I live whom I have to ask permission if I want to cut a branch of my tree that has a diameter greater than four inches. 
And that permission is expensive and they don't necessarily even grant it. And try to talk about trying to cut down a tree, even if it's threatening your house, forget it. Whereas Home Depot and Costco, which also exist where I live, can't force me to do a thing. Now it's true that big companies sometimes collude with government to get government to use force on people, as one big developer in Connecticut did with the new London government to take Suzette Kilo's land. But the crucial ingredient is government. Myth number four, free markets promote war. And the idea here is to get the resources we need, we need to invade other countries. No, there's an easier option. It's called buying. How's Switzerland doing? Not bad, right? How many countries has it invaded and oh, in the last 600 years? None. Trade promotes peace. Many scholars who study war and trade have been made aware of this, have been aware of this connection. In 1950, Baron de Montesquieu stated, quote, quote, peace is the natural effect of trade. That was confirmed in a, in a 2006 study, an analysis of dyadic dispute by Solomon Polachek of SUNY Binghamton and Carlos Siegley of Rutgers. They showed that the higher the gains from trade between two trading partners, the lower the level of conflict between them. A doubling of trade leads to a 20% decrease in belligerence. In short, trading nations cooperate more and fight less, which is, by the way, one of a few reasons why I'd like Obama not to further restrict trade and not to get the Europeans to further restrict trade with Iran, but to completely get rid of the sanctions and let's have trade and let's have talk. Or think of the first few months of the, US, of the Bush administration. There was a major crisis that turned out to be worked out quite nicely. And that had to do with the airplane, the Navy plane, that the Chinese forced to land on Hainan Island. One of my students, by the way, I teach military officers, one of my students was on that plane. And there were a lot of people worried for about a week there that this was going to blow up and we were going to have this bad situation. Now, I have not been able to confirm this, and my research assistant hasn't found it, but it's a great story. I bet it's true, even if I haven't been able to confirm it. Here's what I think happened. I think a whole lot of people like Walmart and so on went to Bush and said, hey, bud, don't mess this up. We got this great thing going with China. Do not mess this up. And both sides had a strong incentive to figure that out and solve it. Or think of India and Pakistan that have been at each other's throats since Pakistan was formed. And yet trade has grown between them. And as trade has grown between them, they've worked out, worked these things out. I was in a cab when there was one of these things in the early 2000s where it was getting a little heated over the Kashmir, I think. And there was this Indian cab driver. And uh, I always like talking to cab drivers and getting their, their perspective. And I said, Jim, I'm getting nervous about you know, this thing blowing up. He said, oh, no, they trade like crazy. They'll work it out. So teach me economics, cab driver. Myth number five, free markets promote stinginess. Just one just obvious comparison. Talk to people who lived in the Soviet Union about how generous people were with each other <coughs> back then versus how generous people are here. Or look at what The Economist said about our generosity. And by the way, The Economist, who here ever looks at The Economist? Well, if you've looked at it a fair amount, you know they had this certain kind of snooty attitude right, to, to Americans. We're the great unwashed. We kind of blew it 236 years ago when we had that revolution. You know, oh, that was such, such bad taste. You know, and, and, and so they always kind of put us down, looked down at us. But here's what the economist had to admit about Americans. The average American gives a little over one weekly paycheck a year to charity, the highest rate in the world. Moreover, half the country does volunteer work, averaging more than four hours of it a week. Moreover, the article went to point out that only 5.4% of over 65s live in an institution fewer than a decade ago because their, elderly, their relatives are taking care of them. Eight out of 10 disabled elderly people live outside institutions, and 95% of the mentally handicapped still live with relatives. I have foreign students in my class, and one student from Greece a couple of years ago said he was so glad that his kids got to see America and got to live here and see the, our daily lives because people in America form organizations, form groups, take care of things. They don't wait for the government to do it the way they do in Greece. 
So those are five myths about free markets. I got more to go if, uh, if you have longer time some other time. But my bottom line is markets work really well. Let's not mess with them. Let's not throw them away. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. We'll now move into the question and answer portion. So we'll take a few audience questions. And please just remember to use the mic when you ask them. You just mentioned The Economist. Um, they, this last issue was running something about state capitalism, the new model. I don't know if you saw the cover of it. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I so they go on and on about you know how, I'm not sure exactly what the perspective of The Economist is on <laughs> this type of issue, like economic issues specifically, but they seem to be arguing that there's this sort of hybrid model that a lot of states are developing and that it's very successful where there's like, essentially it's like third ways, sort of, kind of like you have set heavy government intervention, but there's like a, a free market as well. They cite they seem to cite a lot of countries that are like already resource rich or something like Russia, where you can basically you can substitute government intervention for a free market sometimes because they can sell oil and all of these other things. Yeah, it's really yeah. to take that case. Yeah. I know you haven't yeah. got to your question, yet, but just yeah. mm. Russia. The reason they're doing as well mm. as they're doing is because the price yeah. of oil is so high. Price of oil falls to thirty bucks. They're in serious trouble. Yeah. But go on. So, um, how? When it, you know a reputable magazine like The Economist says, you know, makes a claim like this that this is the new model and that it's successful, what what level of government intervention, what level of regulation do you think is appropriate? And do you think that this the, these ideas about I mean, obviously we know that communism and socialism don't work, but yeah, yeah. what what do you think when there are all these kind of different dissonant voices saying this is kind of the right model, that's kind of the right model? What would you see to be the right model? Okay, yeah. So the right model. Uh, and you'd think I'd have this resolved by the time I'm at my age, but I don't totally. But, but let me tell you how cl I'm, I'm close. Uh, I think the right model is basically, uh, absent some very strong case, essentially no government regulation. And y y just across the board, and I'll give you the little exception, but even point out why, the ex why when you have government, it hasn't worked totally well. Okay, so, so much of government is government just intervening in relationships and exchange transactions where those people are perfectly capable of working out themselves. So an easy example is the minimum wage. The minimum wage is the government saying, not we're guaranteeing a job at the minimum wage, but we're guaranteeing that if you get to work, you get paid the minimum wage, which is a very different statement. As Paul Samuelson, the author of the economics textbooks when I was an undergrad, said when the, someone was proposing to raise the minimum wage to $2 an hour, how does it help a poor black youth to know that if he gets a job, at, he'll be paid $2 an hour, when the fact that he must be paid $2 an hour is what prevents him from get a, getting the job? So there are a lot of things like that, exchange, interve intervention in, in exchange relationships. Then there are things where government just says, we don't like the fact that you're consuming what we think you shouldn't consume, whether it be pornography or drugs or cigarettes. Those are all voluntary transactions. Those are people deciding they want to take those risks, they want to do those things. And so there's a lot of that. There's occupational safety legislation where the government says, uh, we th don't think employers will take good care of their workers. And that ignores this simple fact, that if you, if you have a timeline here, and I'm doing it from behind the chart, and, and here's fatalities per man hour. And if you look over time, here's what's happened. Now you tell me in there where OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, was formed. Well, it was down here, right? So it was falling before and it fell after. So just so many things like that. You take the government regulation, and I say there should be either none of it or less of it, with, with no exceptions. Now, the one problem that most economists have, and I have this problem to some extent also, is the issue of externalities, and specifically negative externalities. So someone has a factory somewhere that pollutes the air, and the pollution blows downstream and hurts someone else. There are enough of those someones, there are thousands of those someones, that it's very hard to get together and have an actual contractual relationship between the thousands of people polluted and the polluter. And people have said, well, there's a case for government regulation. And in a perfectly theoretical way, that's true. But then you have to look at how is government regulation worked out? Um, and what would have replaced it? So, Many people, some economists have pointed out that if we hadn't had the Environmental Protection Agency came, come along with its heavy-handed administrative regulation, we would have had the common law handle it, where people could go and say, 
we're suing you because you're polluting our air. And it'd be interesting to see how far that would go. I have a chapter in my book, The Joy of Freedom, an Economist Odyssey, called The Environment, Own It and Save It. And I point out that the rivers in Scotland are just completely clean and they're privately owned. That um, in Ohio, there was this move in the late 40s to allow common law to take over and you would get uh, people being prevented from polluting the water and the, the legislature stopped that. And so we, we didn't go that route and it'd be interesting to see how far we could go. The problem I have, and let's say we still say, well, we need some government regulation. The problem I have is the same incentives in the private sector that got us in the mess are, exist in the, in the government sector. That no one who I know of who advocates regulation, who advocates government, has come up with how do you prevent, how do you give them incentives to do the right things and to avoid the wrong things? And so it's still kind of the unanswered question. That was a long answer, but that's, I think I needed to. Um, I have a question about sort of uh, what role the government might play in like when forces like creative destruction start um, kind of uh, leaving people out of work, people who can't uh, transition into new jobs quickly. Do you think the government has any role in maybe trying to retrain people and increase productivity in that way, or, sh or is it just kind of something where the, the free market will, over the long term, you know, obviously uh, kind of fix itself? Yeah, I, think it, it, I don't think government should have a role, and I think government's role has actually slowed things down. So let me just mention, you mentioned creative destruction, so let me just mention for people who might not have heard that term. It came from Schumpeter, whom I quoted earlier about Queen Elizabeth, and he said the capitalist process is this dynamic process of creative destruction where, say, the car comes along and the buggy whip manufacturers disappear, and there are, there are jobs freed up in the buggy whip industry and they find jobs elsewhere, or there are workers freed up and they find jobs elsewhere. And that's true. I mean, if you look at the fact that in 1920 we had 40 million people working, and now, even with our unemployment rate, we have about 150 million people working. Clearly, there's no lack of jobs. There's no lack of things to do. So yeah, what happens is some industry disappears, another one forms. Uh, and it has as potential employees the people in the industry that disappeared. Think about, remember when Obama, a couple months ago, talked about ATMs and how they wipe out jobs? Now, I, I didn't jump on him the way a lot of my free market economist friends did, because I really listened carefully and I read carefully and I didn't see him necessarily saying that was bad. But it is a fact and, it is a, and, and therefore it does put some people out of work. But then there are other things we want them to do. Labor's not this plentiful commodity, labor's a scarce commodity. And if you doubt that, I've got a job mowing my lawn and I'll pay you 10 cents an hour. Right? And, and you'll see how, how, uh, how scarce labor is. None of you will volunteer for it, even aside from the minimum wage law. So, so it's, it's a scarce commodity. Now, I showed it to my students recently this thing in class where I looked at technolo technological advance in one industry, te long distance phone calls. And with fiber optics and various switching devices and so on, we've reduced the number of operators we need by over 70%, by lo long distance operators by over 70%. Well, the number of phone calls in that time period I looked at has more than 10 tupled. If we hadn't, if we had been stuck with the old 1970 technology, in order to have that same number of long distance phone calls we actually made in 2000, instead of having a quarter of a percent of the labor force in telephone operators, we'd have a three and a half percent of the labor force in telephone operators. And then there are those jobs that aren't being done because they're working in those in, as telephone operators. And when I show them this table, I show them the table first, and then I put the label on top of it. Why there is Starbucks. I mean, wh where are we going to get workers from Starbucks if they're working as telephone operators? The history of economic growth, the history of, of advance, is doing more and more with less and less. So now to your point about um, people being out of work for a while, it's true. And so the solution is make it easy for them to find other work. 26% of people in the U.S. labor force now are employed in jobs where they have to get government permission to work, where they have to get a license or, or something like that where it's not always easy to get. 
I don't know if you remember the, <clears throat> the fall of 2009 when President Obama wanted to speak to all the school students. Remember that? And he gave a talk. And there was all this controversy about, oh, should he be speaking to the students, which, okay, I understand that controversy. But no one ever actually looked at his speech. Well, I tend to look at people's speeches. And he made a point, and I'm not beating on him for this because he's just explaining an absolutely true fact about the world. He was telling people to stay in high school. And he had to give a case. So his case was he named seven occupations where you need a high school degree at least to get those jobs. And I looked at all seven. One was military. Well, that's government requiring it. Second was police. That's government requiring it. The other five were doctor, lawyer, and three other I've forgotten where you need government permission. So he's reporting on a true fact of life. It's a sad fact of life that more and more we require government permission to get certain jobs. He did not say software developer because you could be a, a high school dropout and be a software developer. And so the point is, get rid of those rules, get rid of those restrictions to open things up and make it easy for people to, to move between jobs. I talked to a friend who got back from Spain um, about a year ago, and I said, what, what's your impression of Spain? He said, well, it seems like a freer economy than we have. And I thought, oh, okay. So why is that? He says, well, there were kids selling beer on the beach. And I thought, what a great idea. You know, why not get rid of those laws and allow people to sell beer to people on the beach who want beer. I mean, they're just all these transactions that are being prevented, whether it's the Keystone Pipeline or people selling beer or people selling marijuana. They're just all these productive, valuable things for people to do, and the government is stopping them from doing them. Uh, So I think that uh, every my personal you know opinions are very libertarian economically. So I think everything you said you know I find uh, to be right on. But the Thanks. point <laughs> the the, the, po the point I see is that you know in this country so many people believe in those myths. You know even if they are somewhat conservative, they certainly don't buy into the full logical conclusions of free market economics. Yeah. And because of that, we have a fairly you know narrow band of you know economic movement between what we call the right and the left in this country. And you know I think. You can make the argument that it's much further to the left and restricting people's voluntary exchanges. My question is, how further do you further to the left than what though? Oh, then it you know than being economically free. Oh right, right, okay. <laughs> my my question is, how do you change that in our political culture? How do you have people buy into the fact that these myths are myths and uh, enable a free country to exist given our current political climate? Well, um, good question, a and. So one thing I'm doing is what I just did, right? So this is being broadcast, you're getting it. And what I'm hoping is that next time you're in a discussion with someone, you'll draw on some of this. Uh, and uh, in fact, by the way, if anyone wants, just give me your email and I'll send you my notes. Then you have all the little details there. Beyond that, I think it's to talk to groups that you don't normally talk to who have never thought about it that way. So I was surprised when two months ago, I got a phone call from Occupy Monterey. And the guy asked me if I would give a talk at their Occupy Monterey event. I said, you know who I am, right? And he goes, yeah. I've seen you speak at two anti-war speeches. And I said, OK, OK. So we talked about it. And I said, well, tell me your views. And I said, well, all but two of them I disagree with. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so anyway, so he knew what he was getting. And, and the talk went great. And you know, most people, and one of the big, it was titled, I titled it, crony capitalism versus the free market. Because one of the things most people think of when they think of the free market is not the free market, but crony capitalism. So I just laid out strongly the case against crony capitalism and actually got into some of these things I talked about here. And so I just think it's keep talking to people and uh, it's hard, it, it's not easy. You know, um, Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave in the 19th century who really was you know, participated in the biggest libertarian victory of the 19th century, the end of slavery, said, you know, those who, those, you can't have progress without struggle. Those who want, I used to know this by heart, those who want progress without struggle are people who want the, the rain without the mighty roar of the wind, and you know, on and on and on. He said, power never concedes not anything without a demand. It never did and it never will. Ask people how much uh, oppression they're willing to put up with, and that's the exact amount of oppression they'll get. And so I believe in just fighting the, against that oppression on all margins. One of the things that I always get heartened by is when people fight for their freedom, sorry, people fight for other people's freedom. So we talked briefly when we were just chatting beforehand about 
how Obama is cracking down on the Catholic Church in a fundamental way, which is a big, big step for a, a federal government to take. And I'm not a Catholic, but I completely am on their side on that. Um, and, uh, and by the way, I, I mentioned marijuana. The odds that I would ever use marijuana are pretty low. Um, and, but I'm going to still fight for people's right to take it. And, and so I think that's the other thing. Get credible and be credible not just by fighting for your own freedom. Do that too, but be fighting for other people's freedom and arguing for other people's freedom. And write letters to editors. You know, it matters, it matters. Um, um, so uh, you made uh, an interesting point in regards to um, engaging in conversation to you know, change people's attitudes and beliefs um, on, on some of these myths. And I guess my, my question for you is there, so there are some studies that show um, when people with differing beliefs engage in discussion, it often ends up in a debate right. sort of form. And the result of that is oftentimes is that both party walks away with stronger beliefs mm -hmm. and their ideas than they originally had, and in essence reaffirms mm -hmm. and solidifies um, rather than, you know, changes attitudes. So I, I, I guess, so how, do you how, do you, how do you approach it? Okay. So I have a colleague, and he's not a libertarian by any means, uh, not at all, uh, but he gave the students this little exercise in class one day. He wanted uh, students to pair off and one student would take something that, student A takes something that he really strongly believes, and he pairs them off with someone who in advance we know doesn't, just uh, disagrees with that. So A is trying to persuade B, and they do that for a while. And he says, okay, now I want you to come back in the room and say, okay, all the A's out there, did you persuade anyone? And seven, of them out, seven out of 15 put up their hand. Okay, so who were the bees? There were seven bees. Uh, were you persuaded? And like three of them put up their hand, right? So I thought I persuaded, but I didn't. So then he said, okay, the, the four of you who thought you persuaded but didn't, tell me what you did. Well, I can't believe I didn't persuade. I made the most eloquent argument. I had facts, data, logic, history. Okay, so the people who did persuade, the three of you, tell me how you did. Well, it's interesting. I didn't try to persuade. I uh, just started asking the other person, the B, why do you think that? And, and tell me more about how, what, how, did, how did you come to that belief? Do you remember when you ever didn't have that belief? And it just loosens up the person. Um, this isn't a perfect example, but on my blog this morning, I uh, reprinted a letter I'd written to the Monterey Herald that ran yesterday, in which I took on this young student who said that they deserved a quality student housing. And I said, that's what I call a phony right. And so, this guy comes on, you get all kinds of commenters, right? This guy comes on and says, you know, you don't care about blah, 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 blah. And I said, did you notice your logical leap there? I didn't want government doing it, and therefore you're saying I don't care about it? And I tried to do it as gently as I could. Like, be gentle, that's the other one, be gentle. And the guy comes on half an hour later and says, yeah, you're right, that was a logical leap. Oh my God, I'm, how often does that happen? You know? And then he said, so the real problem is, how do we take care of them? And I said, oh, okay, we're on the same ground here. Let's talk about how we take care of poor people, right? And, and so we can talk about that. And so my view, and I do this on my blog, is I generally, every once in a while I'll lose it, not badly, but a little, on the margin. Um, but most of the time I'm trying to dial it down, try to talk it down a little, like a guy, I actually had a good criticism about my, my letter to the editor. So I said, look, your first criticism I totally disagree with. Your second criticism, uh, something to it. I've got to think about it. You know? So I just, there's a, there's a give and take. That's a piece of it. How are we doing on time? I think, I think uh, we're unfortunately running out of time. But um, let's give Dr. Henderson a hand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Uh, thank you all for coming to the lunch.